Okay, hello and welcome to uh, another episode of the Athlete Hot Seat. Today we're going to be finding out about an area some of you uh, may have considered trying for yourselves uh, and for others of you might not even have known that it's a thing. Okay, and that is the possibility of going to university and rowing in the United States. Something that's becoming more and more possible and popular amongst British junior rowers and so it's a topic I was keen to bring you some more information on. We're really lucky today to be joined by one of our former pupils, Patty Taylor, who went to Syracuse University, and her GB teammate, Fee Gammond, who was studying at the University of Washington. So let me bring them in. Hello, Fee, welcome. Hi. Hello. And Patty, welcome back to Sir William Perkins, I should say. Um, really nice to see you guys and have you here with us today. Um, we've got lots to talk, talk about, lots to talk about. So let's just jump straight in. Um, you both had some really good success as junior rowers. OK, Hattie, as we've said, you did a lot of your junior rowing at Perkins. Um, not in our new boat house, but on the river in Staines. Won national medals there. Um, Fee, you went to Headington um, and you made your international debut as a junior, the Junior World Championships. Um, and you were, you were actually in the only women's eight that's ever won a gold medal there. Um, so, Fee, I might have taken your answer for you already. But my question for both of you to start with, if you were to pick one highlight of your junior rowing careers, what would it be? Kind of one standout moment. Hattie, maybe we start with you. Um, I started from a junior box, but I didn't do any like, junior world stuff or anything, so mine would probably have to be the team. Um, and we won that schools in eight in it was like J6, I think it's J16 eight, yeah. J15 eight in 2009, maybe. And, um, I feel like winning a gold medal at anything is great, especially when you're a schoolgirl and you just like eat, sleep, breathe, row, like do it, you know, you're obsessed with rowing. It, it was great, yeah. So, probably, probably Nat Schools, um, Jane, I think it was, winning that, that was great. That's awesome, awesome day. Some of our girls have been lucky enough to experience Nat Schools medals and lots more of them have got that to look forward to in the future, I'm sure. Um, Fee, how about you? I would say in 2009, 2009 when I went to Coupe de Jeunesse, um, I went in a pair and I did an eight on Friday. It was like um, kind of a match racing. So I had two pairs races on Saturday and Sunday and the eight race on Friday. And um, that summer was the first summer that I really like had started getting the passion for rowing and really wanting to do it full time it was like the first insight into what it was like training full time and that was like then my dream was to be on the senior team and that's what I that, that's what yeah that's been my dream for the time <laughs> that, that's awesome so getting a really good taste as a junior of something that you are you find yourself doing all the way up to today that's really... yeah no and that's the pinpoint moment when which I was like yeah this is what I want to do as, yeah. um, when I'm older and now I'm older. <laughs> I'm very lucky. Yeah, that's that's awesome. It's it's very special, I think, looking back, having a moment that, like you say, there, you know, for both of you having a moment that you can pinpoint and be like, this this is just a great feeling. And it's coming from a sport that I am loving doing. That's awesome to hear. Hattie, um, looking back, at what point as a kind of going through your junior rowing, did you know that rowing was something that you kind of wanted to or almost needed to pursue at university? Um, I think probably it was uh, actually during my gap year. So I, I, I left Perkins after you had and went to the form and I sort of like the road kind of like faded off a bit, like I think with the transitioning schools and new friends, restrictions, whatever, that was probably put on the back of a little bit. And then I um, went to work for the university for my gap year. And then I was like, oh, I'm going to go on a This is great. This is like what I've been doing for seven years. But, um, I, I want to keep going and rowing. Like I just, I've never felt 
the need to give up. Like now, even I'm like, oh, I just don't even ever imagine quitting. So I think then, if even though it dwindled a bit and like, and, and after been doing it for a couple of years, I was, I picked it back up again in Melbourne and I loved it. And I was like, oh, great, well, if I can have the chance to go to university in the US and be on a great team with all these amazing facilities and coaches and teammates, then I'm definitely going to have to do it. So I think probably during my year, Oh, I'm getting it. Listen, I remember this. I remember why I love it. Yeah, it's like it's um, it's that feeling, the motor skills coming back, and just that feeling of being in a boat, isn't it? There's something special about it. How how about you, yeah. Fee? When you when you were a kid, did you think, did you think, oh, maybe uh, maybe rowing's not for me, or did you just think, I'm I can't not do this? Um, no, I. I guess I'm, I'm always one of these people that's like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit now. This is gonna, be, and then I'm all, never quit. I just, I'm gonna have to be saying, oh, that, that'll be it. And then I can say, it just hooks you in, doesn't it? Like you just can't. I don't know. You get the, the bug, and everyone talks about the rowing bug, and yeah. you can't stop. So. Yeah. No, I, I, well, I, I definitely know what you mean. I'm still, still here, and I don't even do it anymore. <laughs> um, so, uh, kind of moving on a little bit for. A lot of a lot of young rowers, and it's been the case with lots of our leavers over the kind of over the last few years. Rowing's been one of the major considerations for them uh, when it comes to where they want to go to university. Um, uh, I know neither of you. Uh, we'll come on to this a little bit later. Had a kind of long-term plan that you knew you wanted to row in the states at university. Um, but, um, fee start with can you just give us a little bit of an idea of how you actually came to getting across the pond and going rowing there how did how did that come about for you yeah it's one of those times in my life that i've really thought oh, this looking back it felt like fate it kind of all just went into place for me it was never really my goal to go out to america um when i had done the summer in 2010 with junior worlds and then i went to the olympics um I kind of got the feeling that there were recruiters that recruited you and were like interested. And I don't know, they they, they send you emails and it just kind of makes you feel like, oh, okay, some, someone's interested in me. Um, so I was messaging them back and forth at the beginning of my last year of school. Um, and from there on, I did my SATs, which is the exams to go and visit, um, the exams to get in, and you have to do them before you can do a visit back. Um, I did them in Christmas. Um, I like to say that when I was doing it, I did no studying for it whatsoever. Every page was surprised when I was, <laughs> it was um, when I was taking the exam. Um, I was mostly trying to focus on my A-levels, and my parents, I, wasn't, I was struggling a bit with, um, management and my parents like you just need to focus on getting into the university in the UK and so after Christmas I was like okay I got the results back from my activities and it was like fine but I was like okay I'll focus on um, going to uni in the UK um, have my sights set on Newcastle however um, coming closer to the exams I was struggling with my maths and also, I was at the year where the grades were going up, not the grades, the fees were going up from 3,000 to 9,000. So everyone was applying that year. Mm -hmm. There was, it was like rumours that it was going to be really hard to get, like, if, if you didn't get your grades, that would be it. Like, you wouldn't be able, they wouldn't let you in. Um, I missed, I kind of figured I was going to miss my maths grade. And I got an email from the University of Washington, which was one of the universities that had been emailed the week previously. And they said, oh, we've got someone coming over for Women's Henley. Do you want to meet up with them and have a chat? And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll do that. I'm at Women's Henley Racing anyway. Why not? So me and my mum got met up with Colin, which um, he was actually one of my coaches in the end when I went there. But had a good chat with him. And, and um, yeah, I was interested then. Um, I was kind of like, hmm, this sounds, he was really selling it to me. Yeah. <laughs> this sounds great. And then um, Junior Worlds that year was at Thorny Lake in Eton, and the head coach came over, and we went and met the head coach, and he sold it to my parents, and they were like, okay. <laughs> so the week after, they booked a, because I'd done my SATs, so there was no problem with, I remember asking them, how many A-levels do I need to get to get in? I think I might not get my math A-level. They're like, oh, it's fine, like, don't worry about A-levels. I was like, oh, it's fine, quite nice. <laughs> um, and then I, we organised a trip over, I 
did like one of the four, I think it's 48 hour trips that you can go and visit. Um, and me and my mum flew over in the middle of August after the Junior World. Um, and the, I think the day I arrived back from the States was my results day. So I had a great trip out to America, kind of was like, this is great, and almost signed there, but didn't. Got my results that day, didn't get into Newcastle, and said, oh, right, I'm going to America then. And then there was kind of a rush to get my visa in yeah. time for September. <laughs> but that, it was, it's really weird, it all just happened for me yeah. quite Sometimes, quite sometimes things like that can happen, can't they? It almost snowballs, and then you end up doing yeah. something you've never planned, but can it can end up being one of the things that kind of changes your life um yeah definitely and like when i went to visit i'm sure we'll get on to it but the facilities out there are just amazing and oh, we'll go on to that surely yeah. but that's no that that's a really it's a really interesting story because that's the thing no one will have the same story of how they ended up kind of going into study in a totally different country um patty move, moving across uh, to you and your experience you didn't have a, it's not entirely dissimilar to fees in some ways, um, but it's spread across a slightly longer time frame uh, than fees kind of last minute rush that she did, talked about there. Could you tell us about your experience kind of through, from A-level results through that gap year that you talked about up until when going to the US became a realistic proposition for you? Yeah, so um, this is my grades to get into uni. Um, at the time, I thought it was absolutely the world. It's just like, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to take a year out, tr like do some things in my year, travel a bit, and then reapply. I, I, I think I, I ended up not doing them, but I um, lined up to do gigs for my year levels in January or whenever it was. Um, so I worked from September to January, uh, beginning of January. Uh, like, I was like a barista in a coffee shop trying to earn money to, to, to go to school. I worked from then to then, and in that time, I took my SATs and I was in touch with a bunch of colleges, but never really thinking of the thing that I was about. I think I was just kind of like keeping myself busy, uh, myself distracted whilst I was working. I never ever thought that it was gonna end, I was going to end up going. And so I went to Australia in January. Ended up, I didn't, I actually didn't do the retakes and I didn't tell my parents I couldn't do the retakes. And I don't even know if they know this now. <laughs> um, but I didn't do them and went to Australia, not in life, not really thinking about anything. I reapplied to English universities. So I think I got a place at Brooks. So I was like, okay, well, fine, I'll, I'll go to Brooks in September if, if nothing else works out. And I really thought that's where I was going to end up. And then probably about March. Time, so I'd already been there for a couple of months. March time, um, they send for like features, they send recruiters like all over the world. So there was a, one of these recruiters who was um, <laughs> seeing me and a, and a couple of other girls. Yeah. So I went to I went to meet her and she was like, oh great, and so, you know, like it, like sold it. Like the, the recruiters are very good at their job. Like they know how to how to get you. Um, and I was like, okay, cool, this is awesome, but like, still in the back of my mind, I was like, this just isn't going to happen. And then, probably another month later, I, uh, like, I got accepted, and I did all the stuff, got accepted, and that was fine, got the scholarship offer. Um, and then I was like, I had to tell my parents, because I don't think they knew that I was doing any of this. They were like, cool, she's good, she's got her own university place in England. And I was like, okay, mum and dad, can you please write these questions in America, because it just kind of made um, scholarship and this opportunity to go so what do you think so I just like set them up on the Skype and I think my parents were like oh this is actually happening okay you've been talking about this for so long but I didn't really know this was going to happen um, and then yeah obviously the results to my parents they were fine with it and then I signed my I think it's less than 10 that you sign uh, I, I can't remember what it's called um, I signed that in May which is apparently really late in the process, probably a bit earlier than fees, but um, <laughs> generally like quite late. And then I had to cut my trip home, I cut my trip from Australia a bit shorter and come home in, I think, in June, and then flew to the borders. But I never visited, <laughs> I just turned up. 
and I was like, oh, okay, this is this is where I'm going. Obviously, I I looked at like every single picture on the internet yeah. and read every article and tool through the website. So I knew there was like this, but yeah, I never did so. So I think like for me, it was a bit last minute, and for me, I was like, oh, okay, well, this is where I'm going to be, yeah. and I chose well. Well, luckily enough, that's. A little bit like Fee said, sometimes you just end up somewhere that works without having yeah. necessarily planned it too much. Um, albeit yeah, there is. Really it, actually, yeah. yeah. Um, so we've already mentioned it a little bit, and that's the this requirement to study at the US unis, the, the additional exams to sit, the, the SATs. Um, now, uh, you've mentioned, you know, Fee, you'd already sat them kind of in the middle of your A levels, but that uh, your A-level year, but it wasn't your big focus. Um, Patty, you did them in your during your gap year to kind of give you these extra options. Um, just wondered, um, and I'm sure the rowers watching will be wondering what they actually involve, because um, they're just these, it's another acronym of, to do with exams and they all have different things related to them. Um, Hattie, I wondered if you could give me, give me just a little bit of an overview as to what the exam entails. Um, so from what I remember, they are like like the eleventh class, that's what we have to start the eleventh class. Uh, it's like verbal reasoning, non-verbal reasoning, some maths, and I think that's it. I think it's those three sections, but it's like quite a long exam. Um, and people always are like, it's not the actual exam we have to worry about as much. It's like getting through it and still being being able to concentrate as much as you could in like the fifth hour or the time. It was like four hours and you're like 80, 70, 80 years old. Um, I think it's like practicing more the time of it than the, the actual stuff. Because the stuff, well, I mean, obviously, I definitely didn't do enough reading for it. And in hindsight, I wish I, I'd done a little bit more because obviously I would well, hopefully would have done better with more studying. Um, but yeah, it's basically just like it is like a, uh, a test that you, you I think you do have to do as well, obviously, but like I think you would have to speak for it because it's not it's not just like general knowledge, it's like you know, this non verbal reasoning, verbal reasoning stuff that's like you have to learn how to answer. Yeah, so it's not stand, not just standard subject that you will have covered at school necessarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. That's 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 very very interesting, useful for the for yeah. our girls to hear about. Um, Fee, they're probably wondering how hard it is. Um, you obviously you said you you kind of did yours with not very much prep, and it was a surprise each time you turned the page. But how did you find it, say, compared to the challenge of sitting and sitting an A level exam? Um, well, I remember, all I can remember is I got a book online and it was like a really thick SAT study book and I had done a bit of that. I think it, I remember the math question being quite similar to because I was doing maths at um, A level, yeah. so I might I might have done a bit, bit more revision if I was had done wasn't doing maths A level, um, just to refresh the maths. Um, and then I kind of. I think the English, I just thought, oh, well, I, I'll just give it my best shot. I actually didn't get, like, a great grade. I think I got 1,300, and I think 1,500 is, like, the average. Mm -hmm. And when I was speaking to, um, I remember speaking to Cal, to look at, because I kind of wanted to go to Cal. Uh, they were like, oh, we kind of need uh, 1,800 or more on SATs. I think it's at 2,500. Correct me if I'm wrong, Matthew. It's changed now, but when we took oh, it, it was, was twenty four hundred. But they they switched it to like three thousand. Oh, okay. Well, they they had these grades, and I was well below. And I remember thinking, oh, if I want to go to Cal, then I'm really going to have to take a gap year. Yeah. I think Washington. I, my selection of schools. I, I feel like Washington were looking to build a program, and so I was quite lucky at the time that they were, were looking for like um, rollers rather than. The grades as much um and they were like yeah they wanted to build their own program i think it's it, it just depends i mean i wouldn't say my grades were high just because i'm going to really very high um i definitely remember thinking i'd have to take gap year if i went to cap i wanted to go to cal to try and retake that city yeah but so, your, your experience um, there kind of shows that there is a there's a range of different options for you know lots of different people and different skill sets i suppose um 
and it's, yeah, kind of, so. it's kind of trying to find the right one that marries with your skills. Um, yeah, that's that's awesome to hear about. Um, now, if we just fast forward a little bit, so you've um, well, Fee, you've had a visit. Hattie, you've not had a visit, uh, but the, te the test's gone well. You're on your way. So leaving home, going to uni can be quite a daunting prospect um, anyway, but you guys were moving to a different continent. Um, now that must have, it must have taken a real leap of faith when it came down to it. Um, Hattie, I wondered how much ro having rowing helped you to settle into what was a completely new life? Oh, I think like so much. I think if I'd been there, I mean, we've right, got the opportunity to me, like, we made friends, and you're always going to be around like minded people, and everyone has got the same schedule as you. And um, in my freshman year, all the, all the, so that's first year, all the first year, all the teams were in the same form and rooming. So we just took up in my room, and we were all on like, you know, like five floors or something. So. We were all in the same dorm and all and it more as well. I think if I'd been going there by myself and I didn't really know it, like the majority of the people there, I just would have especially moving countries as well, I would have struggled. So it is it is like a very good thing having a team that you're going to join because you've just got people. Yeah. And like, I get that's <laughs> That's something that applies not just to for you guys moving to a different continent. You know that applies to going to a, a British university or you know finding a rowing club when you leave university and you have a job in a new city, something like that. Um, Fee, uh, I wondered, did did having a sport in rowing that you were so familiar with uh, help you feel that almost you were a little bit more at home, even though you were so far away from home? Um, say when you got to Washington? Yeah, um, it was definitely an automatic support system when I got there um, that, that was in place. So that was help handy. I would say it was a bit of a shock getting in the boat in an eight the first time and realising they spoke in a completely different language <laughs> from the water. Um, yeah, so, so you're talking about like all the different commands. Yeah. Um, that was a bit of shock. Yeah. <laughs> but you soon get to grips with that. I just did have no clue until I got in a boat and was like, oh, right. Yeah, so just <laughs> give, us, give us an example there of some of the differences. You, you're talking a lot about the kind of Cox's technical language, aren't you? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, like, um, way off is stop, I think. I can't really, I'm port and starboard. We don't have that with bound strokes. Um, yeah, it was quite different. And there was one, I can't remember, but easy there. But if they say easy, it's like light rowing. And in the UK, they say easy there. So I would just stop. And then I'd get a blade in the back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but um, no, that was a bit different. Um, but yeah, no, it's an automatic support system. I was, my roommate was on the rowing team. Um, um, so yeah, it, you kind of, it was, it, was, it was nice in that respect. I would say um, I expected it to be a bit more similar than I thought. Like I thought it was going to be. Uh, maybe, maybe it was because I was so unprepared going that it, it was quite different. Um, I I struggled a bit in my first year, and I'm not going to like beat around the bush. Like I I I applied for Newcastle the year after to go back um, because I was. It was far away from home, and I, it was maybe I hadn't prepared well enough because it was so quick for me. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of differences. Like when I got there, the parents, were, the mums were, of the, my roommates were talking about how we have to worry about our safety walking down to the river, which was like a five minute walk away. And I was really confused because in the UK, um, we're very lucky that it, it is really relatively like safe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that was a bit. That there's kind of dif differences like that. Um, I mean, I got, I got a, you have um, pepper spray, just, they're much more like safety conscious out there. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I would say first year was quite, I, found, I, just, I personally found it quite hard adapting. Yeah. Um, but every year got easier and easier for me and I loved it. I didn't want to move back by the end. So there are positives. Yeah. Um, it was just that adapt, adapting 
Um, I joined a sorority in the end of my first year, and I would say probably that's the thing that made me stay um, out there. And a sorority, it, there's a Greek system in the US, like at universities. Um, sororities are group of houses with girls, fraternities are group of houses with boys, and they do like philanthropies and like other activities. And it's almost like a group of friends that you kind of force into being friends with them because you live with them. I was in dorms my first year, but moved into my sorority in the second year. Um, but I joined it at the end. There's like recruitment, but I went through this informal recruitment because they had extra spaces. Um, and I joined at the end of my um, freshman year. Um, probably they wanted me just because British because they love the shark friends. <laughs> but, um, but that's what actually made me stay. And I'm glad I did. And I, I stayed in the sorority the whole time and I had a great group of friends outside of rowing. I think that's what I needed for me. I needed a group of friends that wasn't all rowing. Yeah. I just needed the outside group as well. And I loved it from them. Yeah. So, so that's that's really interesting. I think it's having sometimes having the balance of rowing and something else. Um yeah. so for you, uh for some for a lot of people it's the balance of rowing and studies. From a social point of view, therefore, you're talking about your, you know, your rowers as a social side, and then you the sorority as well. That's that's really interesting. Um, we are just going to need to take a little break. We need to uh, restart the Zoom call because it's about to run out of time. So I'm just going to I'm just going to um, take a pause here, and we'll be back ASAP.
right for back. Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, we are back in the room and we have everyone ready again. OK, um, so, yeah, we've kind of talked a little bit about you getting there. I'd just like to talk about your studies for a moment, because um, that is an area where, again, the UK and the US can differ slightly. So in the UK, generally speaking, you pick one subject to study, maybe two closely related ones. But in the US, there's a there's a kind of a major and a minor system uh, of study. Hattie, could you just outline what that is, how it works and how it works in particular for you and your experience of it? Yeah, so um, it is that you can um, basically shop around for different courses, different classes in your first, um, like you don't have to declare your, your, your major, like your main subject until the end of your second year. So you can shop around um, and do a bunch of different things, which I think is actually great because uh, I, what I applied for uh, to, to do at English universities was just ended up being the worst nightmare, like what I would not have ended up doing. And, and then obviously being given the option to figure out, it and figure out what it is that I was interested in would be beneficial because I took so many interesting classes and things I wouldn't even have ever considered or thought of or didn't even know existed and that I was able to take. So I was taking a bunch of political science classes, which is basically the US version of government and politics. So I declared my major, I think, I think actually after my first year, um, just because I'd, I'd taken a bunch of classes already, and you have to take however many um, to fill ones. That me. So I, I was already well on my way there, and I really enjoyed the classes, and so I just wanted to major in that. And then I minored, I ended up minoring in sociology and also religion. I just took a bunch of classes in that, which I also thought were really interesting. But it wasn't until, I think it wasn't until my last year, so my fourth year, that I realized I'd taken enough classes to qualify them as minor. I was like, oh great, well, I've got two minors already. And I feel like that happens quite a lot because you'll take a lot of classes. And I, uh, I, I ended up taking these classes because the same, the same teachers or the same professors were, were teaching about those professors. So I was like, oh, I'm going to take more classes. And then ended up with two minors sort of by accident as well. Yeah. Um, and I know um, a lot of people go into it knowing what they want to do. I think it's a bit different if you're trying to do um, medicine or... Uh, actually, I think that's the only really specific one because in the you can do like a pre-med uh, sort of track, so you have to do all of those requirements. Yeah. But anything else, you pretty much just drop around and figure out what it is that you want to do. I think is great because I'm definitely I thought I knew something that I wanted to do when I was 18 and that by the time I graduated I was what, 23 and I was like wow I'm so glad I got the opportunity to learn about other things so yeah, yeah it was that's like actually a really big benefit so. yeah so, and I guess that um it that system where you don't have to pay a pin colours to the mask straight away that kind of guards against what some people find, which is they start one degree and then by year two in the UK, that is it by year two, they have changed their mind and they start a whole another course again. Um, that's yeah. very, it's very interesting. Um, you, you can see lots of benefits to that. Um, it's yeah. great hearing a little bit more about it because it is so different to how the UK system works. Um, just moving on to the rowing side of things, um, because you know, that's the thing that brings us, brings us all together. Um, so the U.S. women's collegiate rowing scene is arguably the strongest in the world um, in terms of strength and depth and number of competitors. And Fee, you've mentioned it already, facilities. Um, give, us a, give us an idea what it feels like that first time you set eyes on the boathouse at Washington or even more so the first time you pick the eight off the rack for your first session and you walk out. What's that like? Um, yeah, the facilities, uh, Washington um, especially, I don't know, I can't talk about any other uni because I haven't really seen them, but they have their own boathouse right off, right off on a lake that's five minute walk from campus, almost on the campus itself, 
Um, the Erg Bay is massive. It's huge, and they have low, like probably about hundred ergos. And when they're all going at the same time, um, the men's and women's team, it's just such an awesome atmosphere. And then walking out onto the dock, um, we. So lucky they had. I remember when I was there, was they had two, two, three M packer. Um, they were just getting M packer every year. So lucky with the um, the nice boats. Um, the scenery is amazing. They had um, with Washington off one of the lakes. They had a mountain, Mount Rainier, and it's an active volcano. It's not active at the moment, but it, it could. But it it hasn't erupted in years. <laughs> hundreds of years maybe, I'm not sure. Actually the volcano is fast, so I should have known about that, but I can't remember. Um, but no, the scenery is stunning and you could just um, row for, for miles. Um, what I liked about the, uh, the water especially is that even on the windiest of days you could always find somewhere on the lake that was flat, so you would get a little bit of a good session in somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I absolutely love the scenery out there. Um, very lucky. Yeah, and it is something that you look, you think about US um, university college sport, and it's it, there looks like there's a lot of money invested in in it to support the athletes. Um, and you know, like you say, the M packer after M packer each year doesn't come cheap, does it? Um, so it must be very special to be part of something like that. Um, one one thing about racing in the US, um, a lot of it happens in the eights, doesn't it? Um, and I wondered, Hattie, what sort of dynamic that brought to your women's squad at, at Syracuse, that knowing that you were aiming for such big races in, in the eights of all boat types uh, when it got to the summertime? What was that like? Um, I mean, it's great. Like, so when we were now, we're looking at um, and we thought, of course, we a little bit pairs and some boards and stuff when we were there, but mostly it was eights. And I think, I think when you're an eight, like it's different, so people see this all the time, pushing all the time, so you're like always on guard and trying to and um, they slip up. I think it's it's also good because you, our coach would always be like, oh, we bring everyone with us, so it's not like. You know, the one beat or the one beat is like the first eight. So it's not like the one beat just doing their own thing, forgetting about the rest of the team. It would be like, okay, you'll be in the one beat and then you'll be in the two beat the next day, but you're trying to make everything in go fast and everyone's trying to do that. So it's like very competitive, but also you're doing it for everyone else in your book, which I think is really, is really important because you can't just think about yourself and the team. You've got to bring everyone, you've got everyone from the bottom up with you because you're only as fast as, what's that saying, you're only as fast as your slow member or whatever. Yeah. Um, so everyone was like very competitive, but also very supportive and encouraging of, of, of each other, which I think is... I guess that. that's, that, that's a recipe for success, isn't it? If there's, yeah. if there's yeah. tremendous competition, but huge support for the kind of good of the whole squad. That's, yeah. the, that's the kind of golden golden bullet that everyone is looking for with their squad. Um, thinking about it well, and just, especially in eight, it's like, you can get away with pairs and stuff, but like in an eight, if you're just thinking about what you're doing, then you create something in the past, really, so. Yeah, no, and that's something that the, you know, the pair of you, you were, you were in the eight last year that qualified for Tokyo, it's something that you've kind of taken through with you from your uni days all the way through. Um, yeah. Be, I just sort of wondered, your you must have some really strong memories of those races with six, seven, eight. I don't know how many eights side by side tearing down the course. What sort of sounds and emotions and feelings come back to you when you think about that sort of that sort of racing and the excitement of it? Yeah, um, honestly, it was something like I'd never experienced when I first went out there. Obviously, at um, junior level. Um, there were, when I was racing at national schools, there were two, I know it's completely different now, it's a lot more competitive, but there were like two main schools that were racing out for the Champ 8 at the time when I was at school. And then going out to America where it was honestly six lane racing, close to anything, every boat was equal playing field. It was the most exciting thing. Um, you, could, you could come last by a fraction of a second um, or, or win by a fraction of a second. Like, it was the most 
most exciting thing and uh, nothing I could ever experience before having full course, full lanes of eights. I just had never experienced that before. Um, yeah, what, sorry, just adding on to what you, you were talking about before, um, about the team, the, the best thing I think actually about rowing out in the States is that for nationals, um, it's like a team spot. So you have the two eights, and is it Hattie, is it a third eight as well? And then a four, or a two eights and a four. Yeah. Two eights and a four. But you know, all everyone's place counts for that team podium. And you want to get national champions for the whole team. Yeah. So even if you're in the, um, the four, which is the last boat, you want them to do the best that they can do. And so that's what really pulls the team together. Um, it's unlike anything I've ever experienced before because... Every, you want everyone in your team to do the best they can do and because it's just the medals are team's medals obviously you get medals in the, the varsity eight but overall team you want that overall team to win yeah. and so everyone's really fighting for each other and I think that's what draws the whole team in, like, um, and makes it such a special experience yeah no that's that's a that's such a good good idea isn't it and that um, I think it's it really guards against that feeling of like you said Hattie doing it for you and it's all being about you 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 can't have that if you're a part of a crew and then your crew's part of a team in a competition like that that's that's again such such a great idea um and I suppose in the UK we have a similar thing at the Bucks Regatta the British University College of Sports Regatta um which is that's the British equivalent of what you're talking about where all the different crews add together and I know that um, that's a huge event in the UK as well. So it's not something that you could only experience in the US, but the, I can get from the passion you're talking with it about that it was a really special thing for you guys out there. Um, now, through through university, you were both able to combine your rowing out there with returning to race for GB in the summer at the Under-23 World Championships. You won a good number of medals there, which... You know, that, that must have been an awesome thing, Patty, being able to do your rowing in the US and then come back and have some more fun with some different friends going and doing international races. Yeah. Um, the, so the first GB thing I ever did was my and I think I was like, oh, I want to keep doing this. It was like, like it's probably so similar to people she had a bit of a difficult first year i also had a bit of a difficult first year i think just transitioning and um i mean moving countries and going to university is really going to change yeah. um and then once sort of i got into the training second year um and then was like relatively well and then went home to race that's when i was like oh this is so good and when i have like, the racing as well as I can, and the training home as well as I can, and making these friends, and then be able to go back. And it was quite fun because a couple of the friends that I made um, under 23 year I'm still working with now, and were also back in the States. So I had like other friends um, at other colleges as well. So I was like, so I went to go see, um, so staying with uh, Rowan McCullough, who was at Cal at the time, where we were under 23, so we stayed with her in California. And then, you know, it just like opens up all of these opportunities and these cool things that you wouldn't think of otherwise. Yeah. And so I guess it's just a case of do enjoy the thing that you're doing, do it as well as you can, and then who knows what doors are going to open. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think I didn't even really realise or think that under 23 was really on the radar probably until I mean, maybe even three or the year that I, that I went. I think, you know, I was just getting the training and just sort of fixing on that. And then the, the things that I needed to send back when I was doing for like two days and a half an hour maybe or something. I wasn't even like super focused on them because I was just like, oh, I, need, I was just doing them for myself. You know, I wasn't like, oh, I have to do this really well because I need to send it back to GB. Like, I just sort of did it and it went well. And then I just sent, you know, it got sent back. Um, so yeah, I was just focusing on just where I was at the time, uh, and then so you came back to my focus on that, and then switched back and forth. Yeah, and I guess having having it as an as another option in the summer is an amazing thing to have at the end of your season. Uh, kind yeah. of come back from your life over there to a life over here, and 
be able to get on a plane to go somewhere else to do some racing against some other people from other countries. That's yeah. that's brilliant. Um, now, so post uni, you're both rowing in the national team, like we mentioned. You both uh, you've qualified boat type. Your boat type for Tokyo, not quite as simple as you getting the ticket there and then for yourselves. Um, but uh, like like rowers across the world, you've had your big races postponed or cancelled. And we've talked to a few people during the course of this series about the fact that whether that's, you know, whether your big race is Nat Schools and Henley or whether it's the Tokyo Olympics, it's been a hard time to refocus things. Um, so I just wondered, both of you, say, Fee, if we ask you first, how have you found training during this lockdown time? Um, I'd say it's been up and down. I've had um, good times and done lots so of good times where I've been struggling a bit with motivation. Um, but I keep on coming down to just, I've just got to be systematic about the training. If I do the training, doing the training is going to feel a lot better than not doing the training. <laughs> so that's sort of what I come down to. And um, I kind of just try to have enjoy it and um take a bit of pressure off at the moment um especially because we've got next year to we've basically got another olympic year to build up again so at the moment i'm trying to get on my bike do some running um and just take a bit of pressure off but enjoy it and yeah do the training um as well as i can do really and i guess that's the thing it doesn't need to be world beating training every day but like you say the uh do, doing it because it makes you feel good as well. The, the, the yeah. idea that you'll feel better for having done it than for not having done it, I think, is something that all of us, you know, that are doing sport and training things at the moment have found there are good days and bad days. And that is something that bears true that idea that oh, doing it, I'm probably going to feel a bit better than if I didn't. Um, I saw. I saw the yesterday. You went out for Rowan Henley. Um, how much? How much fun was that going out there? Oh, I've got this now. <laughs> was that was that good? That is great. I've got my single at right, Leander at the moment, and um, I, I'm not doing. I'm only doing ten k. It's just an extra session, um, like just small. But honestly, I never thought I'd be excited about going out in a single. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's not only really my favourite boat, but I'm loving it. That's, that's so good. Um, I'm glad it's fun. It's something that. All rowers around the country are very much looking forward to. I know that being able to get back out on the water. Um, we just just got a question here um, from one of the Perkins girls, who said, "How how common is it for US unis to reach out kind of via social media or emails, things like that? And is there anything they could do potentially to help uh, make that happen, or is it as simple as go and train hard and do well in races?" Um, I, well, I have different options for people that I feel like I, um, I think recruiting is, like, really, really big now, and I think, like, the companies are quite keen to get top recruits and, uh, recruit people, like, if you're doing well at that course, and if you're doing well, if you're doing junior stuff, but I didn't do any junior stuff, so I, I was really on the radar, also I, we did the picking it up. And they're more than happy to chat. So I think uh, I'm sure this is the case now. But when I was um, emailing people, they have recruiting questionnaires on loads of college websites. So I basically went through all of the college websites um, and sent email or did these recruiting questionnaires to like every single college. Um, and then and they just ask if you like your you know your races, if like you you know just general stuff. Um, so I recommend doing that. Or just sending them an email directly, uh, as just expressing your interest and telling them a little bit about yourself. And I, I mean, you don't really have to go into that much detail. They're basically just the like, general facts, and, and then they're very good at emailing back. So it's very much a case of, in your case, being proactive and you yeah. making contact, not just sitting waiting for someone to magically <laughs> discover you. Yeah. yeah, and it's like, no, it's not hard. I think it's just something that really makes the email to be like, hey, I'm interested. Can you give me some more information? Would love to chat. Yeah. You know, or whatever. It's very friendly and they love it. So yeah. they are, they're, 
Yeah. Is that um is that similar to your kind of experience of it, P? Yeah, very similar. I wouldn't just sit around and wait for someone to contact you. Um, I mean, at, only at Junior Worlds did I have, the, I think it was maybe Yale come and talk to me. That's only, oh, maybe I had Indiana come and talk to me. But that's the only two people. Other than that, I emailed around, said who I was, introduced myself. I had gone on websites, just found the recruiter's email. Um, and yeah, they're really... Um, they're really excited to chat to you with your email. Um, I only had really nice things back. Um, and they really help you through the process as well. Like, they're very helpful, guiding you through every step. That's what I found. And at what, yeah. at what point, what age group were you, uh, Fee, were you doing that? Um, so it was my final year of uni. Um, after I'd done Junior Worlds, it was, that was kind of when I got the idea in my head. Um, yeah. uh, because um yeah one of my friends was had spoke about it and he kind of put that seed in my head that oh I could go to America yeah so it's sort of thing that um at a school now if you're in the sixth form it's something that would be worth thinking about doing <laughs> yeah. yeah right that's that's fantastic Hattie Fee thank you so much for spending time with us today um there's some really interesting insights there into a different part of rowing that we we don't find lots about in the UK. Um, so, and I'm sure our our rowers will have found that really useful. Good luck to both of you in the year ahead. Okay, and we'll be supporting you guys all the way to Tokyo. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming, uh, Perkins girls. Thank you for watching. Much appreciated. Um, stay safe, everybody, and we'll see each other again soon. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.